Today is Monday, June 27th, 2016. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And with me is Sue Verhoff, the senior archivist here at the center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Anthony Lett, who served in the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War. Mr. Lett's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Mr. Lett, and thank you for participating. Would you begin by telling us your full name and uh, your, where you live, please? I am Anthony Forrest Lett, currently residing in Oakwood, Georgia, just outside of Gainesville. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your early years, where you were born and growing up? I was born in Miami Beach, Florida, in November 27, 1945. My father and mother were stationed there. My father at that point was a flight instructor for the Navy. And the war had recently ended. And as he completed his, his tour and got out, we moved back to Atlanta. Uh, this would have been in 19, probably early 46. Okay. Uh, I grew up in southwest Atlanta, near Cascade Heights area. Uh, which I consider to be the greatest place and the greatest time to grow up as a kid. There was nowhere else like growing up in, uh, in southwest Atlanta. Uh, I went to E.L. Conley Grammar School. I did not know who E.L. Conley was until fairly recently, and as I've uh, done uh, genealogical research, I got curious one day as to who was the fellow my school was named after, and I did research, found out that he, he was an influential uh, politician in Atlanta and a doctor and had been in the Civil War and so forth. But So anyway, I was in grammar school in uh, E.L. Conley. Uh, first three years I went to Brown High School in, uh, in West End, and in my junior year I transferred to Southwest High School. I graduated in uh, 1963 and uh, started attending Georgia State University in 1963. Um, growing up in Southwest Atlanta, like I said, was fantastic. Uh, among other things, my, uh, my father was my Boy Scout master and my dad had been an Eagle Scout, so he was quite an influence on me uh, in many ways. Uh, scouting was, was fun and important to, to the family. My brother was also a scout. Um, at Southwest High School, where I transferred in my junior year, I had a, the opportunity to reinvent myself um, in terms of going to a new school with new people who didn't know me. Maybe a few did, but most didn't. And it, it was transformative for me in, in a way. Uh, I started getting my legs as to what I wanted to be in life and what I wanted to do and so forth. And ROTC was kind of important. We had to, uh, you know, uh, attend ROTC through high school. And interestingly enough, at our school in 1963, we had an indoor live firing range in the school. It was was not uncommon in those days, but today, with all that's going on, uh, particularly around schools and uh, firearms and so forth, people would be amazed that we, we were shooting in school. So that's, that was interesting. <laughs> so I'm, I'm attending um, uh, Georgia State and as a, as a younger kid, I, when I mentioned that my father had, uh, had been a naval aviator in, uh, in the Pacific off, off the USS Yorktown in World War II. And I was always fascinated by dad's stories and the memorabilia and things that dad had brought home and from time to time one of his old shipmates would come through town and we would always have him over for dinner and I was 10 or 11 maybe 12 years old and I used to just sit there mesmerized by what these men had to say and the experiences that they had and and the tears that they would share and the guffaw laughter about things that happened too. Uh, but that always stuck in my mind, and um, uh, you know, I, I just uh, to this day I have a lot of my dad's 
memorabilia and so forth, and uh, I cherish it because of what it, it represents. So at, uh, at Georgia State, the first year or two, I didn't really know what I wanted to be. Uh, and it was in my uh, sophomore year that uh, I took a summer class, which was a class in archaeology. And we spent a summer excavating at the Etowah Indian Mound site up near Cartersville, Georgia. And that changed my life. I said, this is it. This is what I want to do and what I want to be. Um, and spent an awful lot of my, my life after that pursuing archaeology and so forth. Well, in 1967, when it came time for me to graduate, the Vietnam War was, was heating up, uh, to say the least. Up until that time, my senior year, I hadn't thought much about Vietnam. I didn't know anything about it. If you recall, in those days, the evening news broadcast were 15 minutes and not an hour. And you would listen for 15 minutes to uh, Huntley and Breakley or, or Cronkite. And if my memory serves me, I think that it was about the time during the Vietnam War that they began to expand the evening news to 30 minutes and then an hour so that they could work in more uh, news and information about, about the war. So uh, in my senior year at school, uh, one of my professors came up to me and he said, we're going to have a seminar. And to my knowledge, Georgia State at, up to that point had never done seminar classes. Everything was, was classroom. Mm. And this was a new concept for us. And he said, we're going to have a seminar and there are only going to be three students invited. You're one of them. And the other two were women, <laughs> girls. And the seminar was on Vietnam. And as an anthropology student, I was interested in the culture and so forth. And this was very timely for me because it, it, it gave me an insight into uh, what I was going to be stepping into. And I, I think I'm one of the few people who probably, uh, by the time that I got into the Navy uh, and knew that I was going to be going to Vietnam, I had a pretty solid background on the history of the area, the conflict, and why we were there. So you, for, so early on, you knew that you were going to be uh, going into the Navy. Well, uh, in my senior year, just before graduation, I got a, a wonderful invitation from Uncle Sam to to join this party that they were that they were throwing overseas. And in my mind, you know, I was going to graduate, and I'm going on to grad school. Well, when I got that letter. Uh, it, it caused me to pause and think about, no, I guess I have to be interrupted in my plans here. And r rather than be uh, drafted, I, I joined the Navy. Okay. Uh, certainly my father's involvement in the Navy had, was a real influence on me. And I had the intention of pursuing his path, and that was to become an aviator. Well, my parents' 25th wedding anniversary happened to be the night before I was scheduled to take the examinations for pilot school. And the next morning at 5 o'clock when I had to get up, I, I really wasn't in good shape for, <laughs> for taking this test. And I did take the test and I didn't do well. <laughs> so that sort of changed that thinking a little bit. But I had made the commitment. By the way, I, I was amazed when I when I uh, contacted the Navy about wanting to enlist, they said, great, come down to Macon, Georgia, and we'll swear you in. And I'm like, Macon, Georgia? Why do I have to go to Macon? I'm living in Atlanta. Surely you've got a place in Atlanta. No. And I found out later that I think to this day uh, a lot of people in Georgia have to go to Macon, Georgia in order to, to join the Navy. And I, it goes back to World War II. I don't know why. but. So anyway. So w when you were talking about joining the Navy, were you thinking about enlistment or an officer? Well, I was going to I was going to go to OCS, okay. Officer Candidate School. Yeah. You know, I, I I knew that if if you're going to do it, shoot for the moon and and and, and do the best you can at, at yeah. it. I had a brother who had joined the Marine Corps, 
Uh, and I went to visit him at his graduation uh, in, uh, in South Carolina, and I was impressed by what I saw there. Uh, and I thought, well, boy, that's sort of the epitome of the service as the Marine Corps. Uh, and I remember some of the stories that my brother told me about going through boot camp and so forth. And when the time came, I thought, you know what? I really want to do what my dad did, and I would prefer probably not to get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in the Navy, and I went to OCS uh, in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, in October of 1967, I was 20, I, I hadn't even turned 22 yet uh, when I got up there. And here's a Georgia boy in the frozen tundra of New England in the middle of winter, because we were up there for about four months, uh, marching in the snow up to your, literally your waist, uh, and thinking, what have I done? <laughs> OCS was quite an experience, of course. I've always been struck by what I think is a law of nature, and that is that every military unit, I don't care if you, what, what branch of the service you're in, in every unit there's some kid named Murphy. In all the movies there's a Murph, and lo and behold, in our group, in my class, there was one kid named Murph. And I'll come back to him in a, in a little bit because okay. he, he had an experience that was quite memorable, I think. So I graduated from OCS as an ensign uh, and immediately got orders uh, to, to go to a communication school in San Diego, California. And after that, I was going to join my ship, which I had been assigned to USS Bonham Richard which was an attack uh, aircraft carrier. My father, as I had mentioned, uh, was aboard the USS Yorktown as, a, as a, an Avenger pilot in, in the Pacific. And the bond, the interesting story I found out was that the original Yorktown was sunk at Midway. And my father had actually been assigned to a squadron on that ship but before they left Pearl Harbor, he was reassigned back to Virginia as a flight instructor. So he, he missed Midway, but a lot of his friends were, were lost there. Subsequently, he, he, he did serve as a pilot off of the Yorktown. Well, because the original Yorktown, which was CV-5, was sunk at Midway, they had already laid the keel for the USS Bonham Richard in New York. She's being built and getting ready to be christened. And because they had lost the Yorktown, they decided to rename this ship USS Yorktown CV-10. Lo and behold, the keel on, on the uh, USS Yorktown CV-10 actually says Bonham Richard. And all of the ship's manuals said Bonham Richard. So it's, uh, it turned out that, that I was on the, ne the next ship, which, which became Bonham Richard, and it was the sister ship uh, to my dad's ship, and that was, that was sort of an interesting uh, uh, twist of fate there. Um, when, I, when I graduated from OCS, I had a, a short dilemma. Uh, I, I was given uh, about five days of of leave to, to go home before I had to report for communication school. And that was great. Um, only problem was, I, w when you graduate as an officer, you, you have to have a saber. And I had my saber, and I, what do you do with a saber? Well, when I went to get on the airplane, and this was during a time when some of the flights were being diverted to Cuba uh, back in those days. <laughs> I showed up with this saber, <laughs> and what do I do with it? So the captain came out, and he said, well, I'll, I'll keep that in the cabin. So I, my saber got to ride up front <laughs> uh, until, we got, until we got to Atlanta. I don't know why that story always sort of stuck with me, but <laughs> um, I, I really want to mention one other thing. When I, when I was leaving Atlanta to go 
two officer candidate school. My family, mother and father, and I had uh, two sisters. They wanted to take me to the airport. Great. Dad said, we'll drive in one car and my sisters would follow us in the other car. And then they would go on to work and school and so forth. So we're on our way. I'm nervous because I'm leaving home. I'm going in the, in the service and Lord knows what's going to happen. And we're on, we're on an on-ramp to I-85 and the traffic is whizzing by and finally there was an opening and my father took it. And the next thing we knew was this wham in the back of the car. And my sister driving behind us had not noticed that dad had stopped. So they, they rammed us. And I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm gonna miss my flight. That's not gonna go well for me. <laughs> dad was sitting there with two crumpled up cars and he had to call the insurance company and tell them that he had wrecked himself. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my send-off for the military and officer candidate school. <laughs> but I made it on the plane and, and got there uh, and eventually graduated from OCS, but it wasn't without, uh, without its own stories. Well, yeah, tell us a little bit about OCS and what that experience was like. Uh, well, as I mentioned, it was in the middle of winter time, and that was that was almost a godsend because we didn't have to do a lot of the close order drill and so forth. Uh, the weather just wouldn't allow it. And anyway, in, in Navy officer candidate school, as a line officer, most of it's classwork. You're learning about navigation. You're learning about uh, you know handling ships and and. Uh, everything from loading ballast and, and all sorts of things, communications, weapon systems, and all that. Um, and that way it was, it was challenging. Um, and uh, I remember that I, I, I managed to catch pneumonia while I was in OCS. And um, one thing that I had just made up my mind, I was not gonna, what we call wash out, that is that if you didn't make the grades, you couldn't keep up with your grades or whatever, then then you'd wash out of OCS and then you, you went to the enlisted ranks. And that just wasn't in my, in my thinking. Um, I also didn't want to roll back. In other words, have to drop out of my class and then in effect repeat right. what I'd already been through because it wasn't that much fun. So, uh, when, when I realized I had pneumonia, we were coming up on Christmas break, and and we were given uh, leave at Christmas time to go home for for a, a week. And I remember I had to go to the infirmary because I was I was quite sick, and the Navy doctor there said, "Well, you've got pneumonia, you can't travel." And I said, "Sir, you know what do I have to do because I, d I don't want to be just sitting up here and languishing in a bed during Christmas." So we worked it up where he, he gave me a pass to go and when I got home, uh, my mother's soup and, and cooking was what got me well enough to, TLC. to finish and go back and, and graduate with my class, which was really important to me. So, uh, so I did graduate um, and went to communications school in San Diego. This would have been about in April of 1968, uh, I remember. You know, 68 was a was a time of a, of a lot of political turmoil in the country. Vietnam was becoming unpopular. Uh, there were other uh, influences that were affecting the news, and you know, there was a lot of protest in, on the campuses and so forth. And I remember that um, Robert Kennedy was in San Diego to give a speech, and this was the day before he was to give a really important speech in Los Angeles. So a couple of us went down to hear him speak, uh, and he was on a flatbed truck on, a, on some street in, in San Diego. And we heard him, heard, heard, heard his speech, and then the next day he was assassinated uh, in, in Los Angeles. And it was about, I don't know the exact time on this, but it was soon after that, like 
weeks after that that Martin Luther King was also mm. assassinated. So it was, it was a lot of turmoil, of course, and if you were in the military in those days, you just weren't very popular uh, among, among the population. Uh, and, and so th those were things that, that, that certainly influenced. When, uh, when you were in San Diego, when you went on Liberty, did you ever have any difficulties with any of the protesters or things no, like that? No, because as an officer, we, we didn't have to wear uniforms okay. off base. Uh, and San Diego is a military town anyway, so you know, if, basically you didn't have a lot of okay. trouble. And if you were if you were going to be uh, in places where you know you thought things might not you might not be as welcome, but you just wore civvies. I never had a lot of trouble there, at least not at that time. Okay. Uh, went through. Let's see. Uh, Oh, I, I remember another, this is sort of an, another anecdotal story. Several of the guys that I had been in OCS with were, were also uh, scheduled for that communication school. So there were three or four of us who already knew each other, and we decided to rent a place together out on South Mission Beach in San Diego, um, which was great. And one day we, had, we rented a car, and we were all from back east. And we'd grown up in the 50s. And we said, you know what, let's go to Disneyland. We always thought going to Disneyland would be great. We also said we'd like to see the desert, because we didn't see the desert. Well, we took off to go see the desert. And we're going up, I think it was probably the 5 freeway. And to us, the desert was out west, right? So we're driving up the five north, and we took whatever freeway goes west. And we ended up at the beach, and we're like, well, how did that happen? And we actually, this sounds terrible for navigators <laughs> in the Navy. <laughs> we got back on, went up, did the same thing again until we finally, oh, it's, it's east of here now. So <laughs> we, we finally found the desert, and we finally got to go to Disneyland as adults, and it was an experience. <laughs> um, so uh, we're in communication school in San Diego, and uh-oh, USS Pueblo happens. The Pueblo was a uh, specialized small communications Navy vessel that had been operating near uh, the coast of North Korea. And the North Koreans had overrun and captured the Pueblo and her crew. And this was pretty heavy stuff because it was an, another international incident. The United States was already involved in Vietnam, of course, and now we had a, an international situation with, with North Korea. And they captured the crew. And a couple of the crew, as I recall, I know they were hurt. I think one or two of them might have actually been killed as well because they were fired on by the Koreans. And the commander of that ship was Commander Lloyd Booker. And, of course, there was a, an awful lot of uh, turmoil and speculation and so forth about what went wrong there. I personally feel like that Booker was uh, mistreated. I had the opportunity to meet Commander Booker in, Sa excuse me, in San Diego uh, after his release a couple of years later. Uh, and he was certainly a, a broken man. Uh, but the, the real impact of Pueblo was that all of our communications, top secret stuff, was instantly compromised. Uh, and that had a tremendous impact on the fleet as well as our operations in Vietnam for, for quite a while to come. So here we are, brand new uh, officers heading out to join our ships in the Pacific. I was uh, assigned to the communications uh, uh, division, and and we're facing this as our as our sort of introduction to to the war and so forth. Um, I, after I left, after I graduated from communication school in San Diego, I had to go to Treasure Island uh, in San Francisco to uh, be assigned for a flight from 
from uh, California to uh, the Philippines to meet my, meet my ship. And in, in San Francisco, I ran into a, a fellow who was also a, uh, a fellow classmate in OCS. And this guy was a character. His name was Burleson. And he had been an attorney. And he was a real character. But he and I went out and had dinner that night. He, he had a, a Jaguar XKE. And this was in 1968, and that was a hot car, and, and uh, you know, wow, how do you, how do you pull that off? Turns out his family had money. But so anyway, we, we sort of had a, a, you know, a short reunion and enjoyed uh, dinner and so forth, wished each other well. I found out four days later he, he was killed. Uh, he lost control of his XKE on a mountain uh, in Mexico. And, uh, he, and with him was another of my OC, OCS mates uh, who survived and ended up uh, uh, taking Burleson's body back to his family. So that was sort of our first taste of, of uh, losing our own, you know, yeah. especially when you, certainly not in a circumstance that where you would expect that to be. Um, so I, I flew from Treasure Island uh, via uh, Guam to Philippines, uh, Clark Air Base there, and then took a, I guess it was probably a, a, a bus or something down to QB Point, which was a naval air base uh, near, at Subic Bay in the Philippines. And my ship was operating at that time online at what they called Yankee Station, which was uh, off the coast of Vietnam. And I had to wait for a uh, passage on, on a small aircraft that, that, that flew out to the ship each day carrying personnel and uh, mail and that type thing. And since I was a new ensign and not very important, I kept getting bumped, which made me quite happy because I was enjoying being at the officers club pool for about six days before, <laughs> before I finally got, got sent out to the ship. Uh, one experience, I'm sitting there uh, in, in the officers club at QB Point and uh, the USS Ticonderoga and her crew had pulled in for, for a few days of R&R &R, and I was at the officers club that night and in came the air wing guys from the Ticonderoga and they'd been on the line for like 60 days or so and I could not believe it. These guys came in and hooping and hollering and, you know, they had a lot of time to make up for. Uh, and they had pockets full of cash and they were enjoying themselves. And I'm sitting there watching these guys and marveling at it. This is the best and brightest and they're just out of control. Well, at, at the officers club at QB Point at that time, the club was built on two levels, and the lower level was the dining area, and then there were a few steps that went up to a bar. And the bar was a long bar, and all the whole wall was glass, and you overlooked this wonderful view of, of uh, Subic Bay and so forth. Well, after these guys had been imbibing for a while, they said, okay, it's time for a launch. Well, I didn't know what that meant, but I do know that all the families that were down here in the, in the eating section, they got up and left. And the next thing was, at the bar, it was a low bar, and it didn't have stools. It had padded uh, seats with rollers on the bottom. So a bunch of guys went down where the tables were, and they started lining up the tables in a row. And then they took a chair, one of those chairs, a padded chair on rollers, and put it up on the bar, the far end of the bar. And about, and, a, and one of the pilots got in the chair, and the other, about four guys got behind that chair. And down here where the tables were lined up, two other guys had a tablecloth. This was the arresting gear. And they launched him. <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> And they'd crash into those tables. And I'm sitting there watching this, and I'm, wow. <laughs> the officers and gentlemen, huh? Well, the third guy that they launched was the ship's uh, 
the, the air wings surgeon, and he broke both his legs. So he, he did not get a good landing. <laughs> so I still haven't been out to sea yet, but I'm, I'm wow, this is, this is, this is interesting. <laughs> so uh, the next day, I got orders, okay, you're going to be on the flight in the morning for sure this time. Be, pa be packed and ready to go. Yes, sir. So I'm out there and I'm packed and I'm ready to go and, and I get on the plane and, and uh, we take off. And I'm apprehensive. You know, it's a new experience and I'm a young guy. I was 22 at the time, I think. And uh, so we get out there and we're getting ready to land on an aircraft carrier. And this is going to be an experience to remember. And it was. I mean, you, you come in and you go from, I forgot, 160 miles an hour or something to zero in under a second and a half or so. Quite an experience. So the, the aircraft taxied over to, to the superstructure of the, of the ship and the doors opened and myself and a couple of other officers got off and the crew with, with their uh, earphones and their helmets and so forth started unloading the aircraft and I'm standing there and they take my bag off. Now we're in the middle of flight operations. Jets are, are gassed and ready to go and they're launching and here, here we are, we're getting off. My first day, the guy pulls my luggage off and my luggage broke open and my uniform and all my clothes is swirling around on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier that is launching airplanes. Not good. <laughs> One of those pieces of clothing gets sucked into a jet engine and there goes that jet engine. A lot of people got to know your name. They were scurrying around. They kept yelling at me because I started trying to pick up <laughs> my clothes. No, sir, no, sir, you, you go on in, you go on in. They were, they were vectoring me around so I didn't walk into a prop too, you know. And I'm thinking, oh boy, <laughs> what, a, what, a great, what a great way to start. And I walked in and there was a sailor. Are you Ensign Lett? Yes. They want to see you on the Admiral's Bridge. And I thought, I haven't even, <laughs> I haven't even sat down yet. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I figured, well, okay, this is, this, you know, Dad's not going to be real proud of his son now. <laughs> well, I got up to the Admiral's Bridge, and uh, there was not an Admiral aboard our ship at that time, but that's where my commander had his, uh, his department headquartered up there. So I walked in, and I figured, well, I, they're just going to send me straight to the brig or something <laughs> like that. Mr. Lett, yes sir, reporting for duty. Uh, I understand that you had an eventful uh, arrival. Yes sir. Well, uh, happily we, you know, we were able to gather up some of your gear, <laughs> but the rest of it, son, you've lost it, whatever you had. We'll help you, you know, we're gonna show you to your quarters and all that. So I, I had an inauspicious introduction to the Seventh Fleet aboard Bonham Richard, um, quite, a, quite a day. <laughs> the next, the next uh, problem was uh, if you've ever been aboard a ship, a Navy ship, or particularly a big Navy ship like an aircraft carrier, if you don't know your way around, you're in trouble because you can literally get lost for days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, they delight in, in watching new guys get lost and, and having to ask the directions and so forth. So, you know, we all go through that. Uh, another trick they loved to pull on us was uh, you'd go up to the bridge and one of the commanders would say, uh, Mr. Lett, I want you to take these binoculars, which were this big, they were just huge, and I want you to go out on that wing off of there and I want you to watch out and report any GU-11s that you see. Yes, sir. What's a GU-11? So you go out there and you're standing out there and 
you're looking for a GU11 and you have no idea what a GU11 is until it finally hits you that it's a gull, it's a seagull. <laughs> so that's your, that's your first uh, indoctrination to, to the wonderful harassment of the United States Navy. Other guys had it worse. They were sent up forward to look out for the mail buoy. <laughs> And they were supposed to, because they, you know, they were told that the the mail was dropped off on a buoy out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and uh, your job was to go stand up there for hours looking for the mail buoy, which didn't exist, of course. Um, so I'd been aboard ship. <laughs> it seemed like a lifetime already, and it was one day. Um, I think it was the second or third night that I was aboard ship, and I'd found my way from my berthing station to where the communications, call it communications shack was. And I didn't deviate at all, because I didn't want to get lost. I just, that, that was it. And we were sitting in the ward room this night, and all of a sudden, they sounded general quarters. Well, you know, all of a sudden you hear these loud horns and, and whistles and things, and somebody on the loudspeaker announces, general quarters, general quarters. Well, of course, we, we, we had, uh, uh, we would practice these things to you know, keep people on their toes and all that. But this guy said, general quarters, general quarters, this is not a drill. And I thought, okay. One of my goals was not to get hurt, but this is the third night I'm aboard ship, and we're going to full-blown general quarters. And we were we had we had picked up enemy aircraft, uh, Russian MiGs, headed out to, to our location. So we went to general quarters. Turns out that, that uh, the other aircraft, you know, turned them around. But it was it was an interesting night and uh, got your attention got your attention and I stayed at, at the ready for the next two years uh, because one thing about life on an aircraft carrier is that it's been said that it's the it's the most dangerous place on earth uh, at any given especially when they're doing flight operations and I I have to say that that's probably true because you're on a boat that's uh, in the middle of the ocean, and you're launching and recovering aircraft. That that ship is loaded down with jet fuel and bombs and rockets and, and all sorts of, uh, of other delightful things that uh, can go very bad, as we found out with the uh, USS Forrestal just mm -hmm. shortly before I reported on the line out there. And a number of men were killed, um, and so. We were always vigilant. Our ship too was a was a, a, a World War II era uh, uh, carrier, which means that we had a wooden flight deck. We didn't have the steel flight deck that the large, the larger carriers had. And so we, you know, after being in operations, the wood on that flight deck was saturated in jet fuel and so forth. And any 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 explosion of any type could just you know really be. Could, could be a conflagration. Uh, we used to average five fires a day aboard ship. Now, that might mean something as innocuous as somebody throwing a cigarette butt in a trash can that, that lit paper on fire. Or it could be a conflagration on the flight deck. And when you heard fire, 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 you didn't know which, which you were dealing with. So. You were always on guard, and I and I remember telling friends uh, that for the two years I was aboard ship, I don't think I ever got a good night's sleep. You just, you just, you're always on sort of a mental, mental you keto. Don't, you don't relax. And one reason for that was that another accident that had happened on the USS Oriskany, which was another carrier. Uh, on the carriers, the forward section is where they, they where the junior officers are berthed. They call it the J.O. bunk room. Uh, and on the Oriskany, they had a fire. And it was a bad fire. Uh, and all the, off, not all, a number of the off junior officers who were in that, that quarters uh, died from smoke inhalation because just outside of where you, where you sleep are a 
lockers that, are, that have automatic breathing apparatus, uh, face uh, gas mask in effect. They didn't know how to use them. So they, they literally were found in a, in a stack where they all uh, died of asphyxiation. So shipboard life is, can be challenging and deadly. And every man has his job to do. And if you don't do your job, then you literally are putting the lives of 5,000 other people at, at extreme jeopardy. Uh, as an officer, uh, one of the tasks that you may or may not be assigned to do is to be on a courts martial. And I was, on, I was assigned to one. And this young fellow um, had been written up for being caught asleep on duty. That is a very uh, harsh uh, violation. Uh, and we found him guilty. Uh, and he, he went to the brig. What we didn't know at the time, because just like in our judicial system here, prior events are not admissible. And what we found out after we convicted this young man, and I felt bad about it because I'm a young man and I thought this kid made a mistake, but we found out after we had convicted him that he had a whole string of other things that, you know, uh, mm. he wasn't a good sailor, put it that way. So there's always this vigilance. You've got to be on, you better do your job. Now my job as, as a communications officer, a radio officer, I was in charge of all of the ex external communications from the ship. Uh, and that meant that uh, if, if, our, if we weren't able to communicate, we couldn't talk to our aircraft in the sky, we couldn't talk to the other ships in our formation, and we couldn't talk to any of the the land bases, and we were in constant contact with Hawaii and Alaska and Rota, Spain, you know, there were contacts all over the world. And so it was an important job, and um, I realized early on that even though I was uh, in, the, in the support group, and I, we used to talk amongst ourselves that we, we didn't live in foxholes like our like our brethren in the Marine Corps and the, and the uh, Army. But we lived in, in a gray steel foxhole uh, in, our, in our living quarters and so forth. And uh, I always defer to my, my buddies who were, who were on land uh, because they, they were frontline and they did it. But we were proud of our job and, and our job as support was was critical, especially to these pilots, uh, getting their job done, getting them back safely, and so forth. Um, sure. We're losing. So I've mentioned my first couple of days aboard ship and how eventful they were. Uh, I had been aboard ship two weeks, and we left the line. Uh, we were going on R&R uh, &R for a while in Singapore, and I was excited because one of the reasons you join the Navy is to see the world, of course, and uh, being an anthropology student, I was interested in the cultures and history, and I was really looking forward to it. And we're steaming along, uh, and all of a sudden, uh, I heard four blasts of the ship's whistle, which you, you can't ignore because it is really loud. And four blasts of a ship's whistle means one of two things, either a man overboard or a collision at sea is imminent. And unless you're on the bridge, if you're down below where I was, you don't know which it is, but you assume that it's man overboard and all hands are supposed to go topside to help uh, make sure that we see the person who went overboard. So I went topside and I'm coming out of the superstructure onto the flight deck and we are listing hard to port. I mean, this ship was just like this, and we were turning as hard as we could uh, to the right. I actually had to sort of brace myself so I didn't just, you know, sort of go skidding off the, the flight deck. And coming straight at us was one of these super tankers that was, I mean, she was not a thousand yards from us, and she was just booking it. Well. The captain of our ship, who was a big fella, his name was Theodore Dankworth. 
and he came running out of the bridge and he was just screaming and cursing at the, at the top of his voice. I'm sure the guys on that tanker heard him. <laughs> and what had happened was that we were steaming along in formation in formation, and we're, we're the carrier and we had uh, uh, cruisers and, and, and destroyers and support vessels fanned out to our sides. Under the rules of the road, rules of the road are the guidelines for operating uh, at sea. And they, and they tell all the ships at sea how to, how to react, kind of like cars, you know, coming up to a four-way stop or whatever. And the rules of the road are that if you're, if you're the ship or, or the task force that's heading in a certain direction and another ship comes at you from a perpendicular angle, uh, if they're coming from your left, you have the right of way and they are supposed to alter their course and or their speed to avoid a collision. In other words, our job was to maintain our heading and their job was to alter their course or speed to come in behind us. Well, this ship apparently was on automatic pilot. There was nobody on the deck of that ship. And they were just booking it through the water. And even though we were the privileged vessel and were not obliged to nor supposed to change our course and speed, when you get to the point where a collision is imminent, then you better do something, and that's what we had done. We were taking evasive action at the very last minute. That ship probably didn't miss us. I'm going to guess uh, 100 yards off our off our stern. Uh, the ships that were off to our left had had to do pinwheels to avoid. This guy just cut right through the uh, the, the formation of a of a naval task force, and they just. They kept going, but that was scary. I mean, that that was, and by the way, while we were steaming toward uh, Singapore, I, I had such a after several days of sort of bad luck, <laughs> I had some good luck. One of the big deals in the United States Navy is when you pass the equator, you go through a a ritual. Uh, before you cross the equator, you're you're called a a polywog, uh, and once you cross the equator, you graduate into being a shellback. And it's a big deal to cross the equator. I've, I've met people who were in the Navy for 30 years and never crossed the equator. I'd been aboard ship two weeks, and I'm, and I'm going to make it. The good news was that nobody aboard ship knew who I was, and during, during this ceremony, all bets are off. If you're, a, if you're already a shellback, then you have domination over all the polywalk, regardless of their rank. And for about four days before you actually cross the equator, all sorts of shenanigans and so forth goes on aboard ship. For example, the, my commander, they kidnapped him. The enlisted men kidnapped <laughs> a commander and we, in the communication section, we had an area called the cage, and the cage was locked up. It was, it was a cage. And that's where we kept a lot of the extremely sensitive information. Well, they locked Commander White in that cage for two days. <laughs> and everybody thought it was really funny and all that, and I'm like, wow, I can't wait to see the retribution from this. <laughs> but the, so, the, so the bad news was if, if people knew who you were and if you had already aggravated some people. They had their opportunity to get revenge. And part of the ceremony was you had to go up on the flight deck and you had to crawl, usually under a big heavy canvas, while people were beating you with hoses and so forth. And if they knew who you were, they were gonna, they were gonna extract their revenge on you. It didn't matter if you were a captain or, or whatever. You, you know. And then the final indignity was that you had to kiss the royal baby. And the royal baby was the stomach of the fattest guy on ship. And he sat on a throne and he had a, he was Neptune and he had this little crown on his head. And he had covered his stomach in uh, grease. And as you crawled up to kiss the royal baby, he'd take your head and just bury it. <laughs> 
in his blubber, and it was it was just quite an indignity. Well, they didn't know who I was, and so I I was able to pretty much just skate through it, and, and I didn't have any real problems. It was the one time that being a junior <laughs> ensign worked in my favor. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, when we got to Singapore. I was elated. Boy, I'm in a foreign country and, and it's beautiful and exotic and all that. And the first thing I did was I went to one of the World War II uh, memorial cemeteries and parks there. And, I, and that was when I really got my first sort of gut sense of World War II. Uh, the British soldiers who were in Singapore when the Japanese invaded and so forth were just uh, treated very badly and slaughtered as the as the Japanese were wont to do throughout the Pacific and it just you know here I am in the service realizing that only 23 or 4 years before me my father and his friends and his generation the greatest generation were out fighting these people to save the world and they did it, and it really brought it quite, quite home to me, unlike anything had up to that point. Because we've been lucky in this country, everything that happened offshore, it happened somewhere else, not here. We didn't have these sort of memorials yet that, uh, that brought it home, quite uh, like seeing it for real. So that, that impacted me quite a bit. Um, so Singapore was my first port of call, and it was great. Um, uh, now it's back to the line, back to Yankee Station and business. We, we might operate off of Yankee Station for 60 days at a time before we got into port again. Uh, generally, we operated with three other carrier, two other uh, carrier task forces on Yankee Station. And Yankee Station might vary from 200 miles off the coast of Vietnam to as close as 50 miles. Uh, I remember one night I was up uh, on the bridge and it was, I mean, if you, you can't imagine pitch black until you're in the middle of the Pacific Ocean at night. You, you literally can't see your hand in front of your face. And all of a sudden, off in the distance, I saw these flares going off. And we were close enough to where I could make out what they were. And these were flares that were on parachutes and you could see these parachutes floating down. And I realized that what I was witnessing was an attack, probably on our forces by the, by the Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And that too, even though I'm on a ship and I'm off the coast, uh, you know, we knew that we're at war. And as communications officer, I saw and heard this stuff in real time. Uh, you know, we would we would hear our pilots, and we were all we were also able to pick up other, like the Air Force communications and so forth. And so, we had we had a pretty good sense of of, of the hell that these guys were going through all during that time. Um, I had mentioned earlier about the capture of the USS Pueblo, and the compromise of our uh, secret uh, codes and information. Um, the fleet reacted fairly quickly to it. Everything that was already out was compromised, and so as of some, at some point in time and place, everything was uh, discarded, and we started over with new codes and so forth uh, so that we you know, could, could operate, uh, we, we, we hoped, uh, with, with some safety um, and without compromising ourselves any, any more. Uh, I was, I had, by this time, I had also been made the ship's uh, crypto security officer. And uh, crypto security was actually a step sort of above top secret. And I was officer in charge of all of these really secret codes that, that were issued to our pilots every time that they took off. And these were actual uh, sheets of uh, paper that had encoded information. And once they 
and every day before the pilots took off, we had to issue uh, these documents to them, and each document was accounted was accountable with, with serial numbers and so forth. And once the pilots had gone out on their sortie and returned, they had to turn in that uh, that document, and I had to account for all of them. And uh, you hope that you know you always had them. Every month, I myself and an enlisted man had to take all of those documents into the ship's incinerator and, and verify that each of they had all been destroyed. Um, we used to have a sign hanging up in the communication shack that it showed a picture of a fellow in uh, a striped suit. And it said, lonely? <laughs> Want friends? Then lose your crypto security information. Well, that was another reason for, to lose sleep, you know. Fires aboard ship isn't bad enough, and, and other ships cutting you in half wasn't bad enough. <laughs> now I've got this, uh, this detail, and lo and behold, I got a call one morning, and I said, Mr. Lett, you need to report to communications shack. I get down there, and they're saying, uh, one of our documents is missing. Uh, okay. Which one? Because we knew which pilot had been assigned this document and that he had not returned that document. So I went to find the pilot to find out what had happened. And he wasn't there. And my first thought was, well, we lost another one. But we had not lost him. What happened was, <coughs> excuse me, he, he was hit a, 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 over Vietnam. Instead of coming back to the ship, he had, he had returned to uh, Subic Bay and took his crypto security card with him. And when he checked in there, he never reported to us the disposition of that very, very sensitive document. So it took me about a month to figure out what had happened in that month. I don't think I slept at all because I thought, well, Dad's not going to be proud of, of my, his son in Leavenworth for, <laughs> for losing a piece of paper. <laughs> By the way, that's where I got all this gray hair. I was, I was 22. <laughs> but that worked out okay, I guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the fir so now it's uh, the end of our first cruise, and we and we happily uh, left the line and made the traverse across the Pacific back to San Diego, and we were in port there for about four or five months before we had to redeploy to go back to Vietnam. Um, I recall that when it got time for us to, to start heading back. You go through a period of, of training because you have new sailors, you have new flight crews, you have new squadrons sometimes reporting aboard ship. And so you go through training exercises to be sure that everybody knows what they're doing and how to do it and all this. And they call these carrier quals, carrier qualifications. And these were always conducted off the coast of uh, California before we then went over to Hawaii, where we again conducted carrier qualifications before we went to Vietnam. Well, one of, our, one of the ships that we used to operate with was the USS Enterprise. And the USS Enterprise, uh, we had different turnaround times. So they had already left California, and they were in Honolulu on their way to Vietnam. And we were about a month or so behind them in terms of our, our redeployment. But we were having carrier qualifications this day off the coast of California. We were at general quarters. I'm in the communication shack, and I'm in the, in the radio room. The radio room was an actual voice radio. It was, it was not teletypes and all that. It was actual voices. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, I hear the, the radio start crackling. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is whatever the call sign for the Enterprise was. I don't remember the call name, but 
let's say it, it was Geronimo. This is Geronimo. We have bombs and aircraft exploding on the flight day. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Admiral so-and-so, Mayday, Mayday. And I'm like, whoa. Now, this was the USS Enterprise blowing up off the coast of the Enterprise, off the coast of Hawaii, 1969. We were thousands of miles away. There was nothing we could do. But I, w I was the first ship to hear it and respond to their maydays. Um, and it was interesting to be listening real time live to what was happening to those to that ship. Um, other ships that were in the area uh, came and helped to uh, help save the Enterprise because she almost they almost lost it. Uh, and what had happened there was, uh, uh, I think, an aircraft, uh, the, the rockets underneath the aircraft wing had become overheated uh, by a tug, which was a little, a mm -hmm. little, uh, little truck that they back up under it to actually start the engines. And it had he overheated this rocket, and it just fired across the flight deck into the whole row of of jets that were loaded with bombs and fuel and pilots getting ready to take off, you know, for their qualifications. So that was another uh, sobering experience and it grows you up to realize that even though you're in the Navy and even though you're not on the ground and even though the bullets are not whizzing by, you're in a dangerous job and something can happen at any time. And you have to be diligent. You have to do your job. You have to pay attention, and uh, for for a lot of young men, you know, uh, it was a quick grow up. I was a 22 year old officer in the United States Navy, in charge of a division of 150 men. The average age of those guys was 18. Most of us had never been away from home before, just like my brothers in the Army and Marine Corps and so forth. And it grows you up fast. To be to have that those sorts of responsibilities, um, you know, it used to we used to talk about days of boredom followed by moments of extreme terror, and that's that was certainly the case in 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 some times. Another thing that uh, talking about uh, accidents and uh, and death. Uh, whenever we were having flight operations, uh, there was always a helicopter hovering off the starboard side of the ship and their job was recovery if a pilot if if we had what they call a cold shot and the aircraft did not uh, launch properly and it ditched then their job was to go over and, and uh, try to extract the pilot or if somebody fell overboard or that was their job was and uh, I knew these guys the, the crew on that helicopter I think there were I think there were seven that day and they would always hover off to the starboard side of the ship at flight deck level, which was 50, 60 feet or so above the water. And all of a sudden, the rotors came off the top of that helicopter, and within 30 seconds, that whole crew was gone. They were just gone. And in the, in the blink of an eye, like that, we lost them. And so we lost friends, you know. Uh, I knew these guys. I lost I lost buddies who were in the Army or the Air Force uh, that I went to high school with. One of my friends in high school, I had mentioned that we had a, a, a live fire range in the high school. He always wanted to be a sniper. He became an Army sniper, and they got him. Uh, another friend of mine was in the band. His name was Jimmy Coy. Jimmy played the drums. And he went in the Air Force, and his airplane, it was a transport-type aircraft, I believe, they just crashed into the side of a mountain in Vietnam. He was 19, I, I, I believe, at the time. So, you know, uh, when you're in war, uh, even though if you're not on the front line and you're not in a dirt foxhole, bad things can happen to you and, and, and people you know, and it grows you up. Um, uh, I mentioned my, one of my OCS buddies, Murphy. Uh, 
Murph was assigned to a destroyer, the USS Frank E. Evans. Give me a second. So Murphy was uh, an officer on the, the Frank Evans. They were operating, uh, doing uh, qualification exercises with a an Australian aircraft carrier, the uh, HMAS um, Melbourne, and uh, it was a night time. And they were, as I say, they were doing uh, manu maneuvering operations and so forth. And I don't, I don't know that I ever found out, but the Melbourne uh, collided with the uh, the Frank Evans amidships, cut her in half, and within seconds, the entire front half of that Navy ship was gone. And uh, a lot of men. They they salvaged the back part of that ship and towed it into uh, Subic Bay, and it it was floating there by the dock while the naval uh, inspectors, you know, did their uh, CSI tasks of trying to figure out what happened and so forth, and then they. After they had finished their work, they towed it out to sea and used it as a target practice to, for the other destroyers, and they sunk it. But Murph had been aboard that boat. So, um, other experiences. Uh, what, were, what were some of the highlights for you? Uh, Well, some of the highlights were uh, odd events uh, that other people might think were sort of macabre or uh, not funny, but they sort of were. One example, when we were operating on Yankee Station, inevitably there was a Russian trawler or two that would hover nearby, and their, their job was to jam our frequency so that we couldn't communicate. And it was a small, it looked, it was, their, their ship was a small ship, um, and it was just covered in antennas. And one day, I got called into the radio shack, and we had an admiral aboard this time. The admiral couldn't talk to his, some of his airplanes, and he wasn't happy. He called me up to the bridge, you ain't lived until you've had a three-star admiral asking you how come you can't talk, he can't talk to his airplanes. And he says, well, sir, I don't know yet. And well, you better find out and find out quick, son, and, and get it done. So I go down and I ask in the text, what's, why can't we talk? Well, atmospherics, Mr. Lett. Atmospherics? What, what does atmospherics mean? Well, sunspots and all that, and they're interfering. And I'm like, you want me to go back up there and tell the old man that we can't talk to him because of something that he can't see? I'm not, I'm not happy to do that. And, but I did it, and I went up and said, sir, we're, we're, we're just undergoing some atmospheric problem. Well, you better get it fixed. Yes, sir, I'll, <laughs> I'll do what I can. So anyway, this Russian trawler is operating out there and, and giving us some fits. And we were, we were close enough to them. And by the way, what, what, when we had been in San Diego refitting to go back, they had put in some new equipment up on the superstructure. And even though I had a top secret crypto security clearance, I didn't really know what, the, what it was because I didn't have a need to know. You know, it was not, not part of my job to know what that meant. But anyway, we're operating over there, and this trawler is, keeps interfering with us. And they call me to the bridge. Uh, Mr. Lett, we need, you know, we, is there something you can do to, to, to fix the, the, the sir, they're, they're jamming us. 
Oh, okay. So the captain picked up the, the squawk phone and he called CIC. He said, I want you to take that, that thing that's up on top and I want you to point it at that ship and I want you to turn it on and turn it off. And so I'm, I'm up there watching and these, these Russians were playing volleyball on, on the deck of their little boat with all these antennas. They flipped that switch, boom. It was, it was new microwave technology that was so powerful that it just blasted that thing. And highlights, that's kind of a highlight in a, in a different sort of way. Bad news was that not our ship, but another ship who had that same new technology pulled into Subic Bay. Somebody accidentally hit that switch and it, and it fried the computers in the supply depot. <laughs> you couldn't get a pencil <laughs> in the fleet for, for a couple of weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> but here, here's a highlight. I went topside one night. I don't know why, I just went topside. It was a gorgeous night. There wasn't a, a cloud in the sky. And like I said, you couldn't see your hand that far in front of your face. But the Milky Way looked like somebody had taken a paintbrush and went like that across the ceiling. It was incredible. I'm just, wow. Sit there and look at that. And then another night I went up and uh, had a total eclipse of the moon that I didn't know it was going to happen. Uh, that was eventful, fun. What else are you going to do in the middle of the ocean? You know, you're out there for 60 days. You don't see a tree, a beer, or a woman for 60 days. The stars is about the best you can, you can hope for. You know? We didn't have what they have today aboard ships. We had, we had closed circuit TV, but you know, we certainly didn't have the the, the real time communications that that they have today, where you can sit there and talk to your wife and kids every night when they're going to bed, you know. Uh, we, we still had fairly primitive uh, accoutrements. Um, so we get back, uh, well, another, another event. We had a captain, a Navy captain aboard ship. This was one of the most impressive men I'd ever met in my life. This guy had worked his way up to an 06 Navy captain. He had a uh, command at sea button, which means that he had, he had at some point had commanded a, a ship at sea, which is a big deal. He was a lawyer. He was a psychiatrist. He was an MD. This guy had more stuff all over him. And he was absolutely fascinating guy. And one day, he wasn't there anymore. And people began, what happened to Captain, whatever his name was? Turns out that he, uh, he got caught molesting a sailor. And he was off that boat that day. Uh, uh, with, with his background and credentials and all that, this guy was absolutely going to be an admiral and Lord knows what else. Speaking of which, the captain of our ship, Captain Dankworth, we were in Subic Bay in the Philippines. Out across the bay from QB Point is, was a wild west town called Alongapo. And anything that you can conceive of was available in Alongapo. Uh, if, you, if you ever went there, it literally was like the old west. The streets were mud, the sidewalks were wood, uh, the deprivation and um, uh, that type of thing you've, you've never seen the likes of. But that's where the sailors went for fun, you know, the bars and, and that type of thing. And Captain Dankworth uh, went over one night. And the next day, we were scheduled to leave port to go back on the line. And okay, it's, it's 0600, where's the captain? One thing you don't do in the United States Navy is miss a ship's movement. I don't care if you're 
the lowest guy, or, and in this case, it was the captain. And nobody knew where he was. We actually left port without our captain. They found Captain Dankworth beat to a pulp in a ditch in a long pole. And he had gone over there and got rolled. <laughs> uh, poor guy, I mean, it ruined his career. Absolutely ruined his career. Another one of our pilots, he was a lonely soul, I guess. He smuggled his girlfriend aboard ship. And we found out about a day out from Philippines that he had his girlfriend in his stateroom. <laughs> So they had to helo her back. To, I mean, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. No, you can't. <laughs> um, so then we get, so now we've, we've ended this tour, and we lost a lot of pilots, by the way. This was, this was a bad omen on this cruise, because the very first day we, we were at Yankee Station, we, we drew night ops, and you didn't want to do that as a, as a new with a new flight wing, everybody's new. They haven't had a chance to, to build up their abilities. But we drew night ops. Oh, and everybody was just really on edge because bad stuff can happen. I'm down in the communications room and I'm listening on the radio to be sure we're talking to pilots. And the first sortie off, these guys went in and they were, they were coming in for a run and I could hear this guy, this pilot's wingman saying, Tom, pull up, Tom, pull up, pull up. Boom. And all we could figure out was that this guy got mesmerized by the ack ack coming at him. It's like driving in snow at night. You know how you, it, mm -hmm. it'll just hypnotize you. And they surmised that something like that must have happened. He just took it. Sorry first sortie on our first day and we thought, boy, we still got nine months. It's going to be a, a long cruise. And we, we lost some guys and it was, we lost a lot of guys on the flight deck too. Um, it's a dangerous job on that flight deck. We had kids, one kid got sucked into an engine. Another kid, he was a tie down man they called him and he, he, on his back, he had a pack that probably had a 200 pounds of lead chain that they used to tie the aircraft and anchor it to the flight deck. This kid walked behind one of the jets as, as they were revving it up and knocked him down, and he was sliding along the flight deck, and you could see him trying to get this thing off. He just, he just went over the side, and it was, it was, we didn't even turn around to try to find him. There was no way. This, these things happened, and... Uh, uh, it, it gets it gets close to home. I'm getting close to ending, but so now this this cruise ended, and we're back in San Diego. And uh, I I'm officer of the deck. We're tied up in port at, at North Island, and you know we're in port. We're in San Diego, California. Don't get much better than this. And we're at the end of the runway at, at North Island, and all you hear, because we're in a war and these guys are practicing all day long, is jets taking off and going. Well, all of a sudden I started hearing the roar of, of aircraft, but it was props, loud props, and a lot of them. And I'm standing there and I look up, and here came about 18 Japanese zeros flying overhead. Now, this is 1969, or eight, eight or nine. And I'm, what do you do? Do you sound general quarters or what? And <laughs> deja vu all over again. Well, these, these guys started landing at North Island. What in the world is going on here? Well, they were getting ready to film Torah, Torah, Torah. Okay. And they had flown these aircraft in, and in front of my ship was my dad's old ship, the USS Yorktown. And they were busy painting up the Yorktown to look like a Japanese aircraft carrier in World War II. And so they started bringing these Japanese Zeros over and putting them on the flight deck of the Yorktown because they were getting ready to head to Hawaii to, to film there. 
I went up and took a picture of my father's ship with all these Japanese zeros on it, and I, and I sent that home, and I said, I thought you told me y'all won that damn war. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't believe it. So the Yorktown, with all these Japanese zeros aboard, they, they head off for Hawaii, where they're going to film actually in Pearl Harbor. And when they got out there, and I think this story is true, but I've heard it for, I, I've never looked it up to see if it was true or not. But the story is that when they got a, a, a day out from arriving in port, the Hollywood guy aboard ship convinced the captain of the, of the Yorktown, you know, it would be a great publicity stunt if we launch these aircraft and have them fly in unannounced. And they did it. And that captain lost his job pretty quickly. I mean, the governor of Hawaii was on the phone to Lyndon Johnson like right now. <laughs> the people in Hawaii didn't think it was very funny. Yeah, I can imagine. A few weeks later when we pulled in, they were still filming, and here we are sliding into Pearl Harbor, and every ship that comes into Pearl Harbor, all the hands go topside, and they're dressed whites, and they line the, you know, the, the ship, and you always uh, pay homage to the the Arizona, while Japanese zeros are flying around. <laughs> you can't make it up. <laughs> so then, when we hit, so we, we're heading back to Vietnam again, and we always take the, the Great Circle Route, which takes you real far north, very close to Vladivostok. And we knew that when we got close enough that the Russians were going to vector out a couple of bears that you know, they're a huge B-52 type aircraft. And we knew they were going to do it, and we knew when they were going to do it. So the, on the loudspeaker of the ship, they said, everybody wants to see the Russian bears go topside in 15 minutes. So I'm up there, and here comes this Russian bear at about 50 feet, and he's pretty close to our ship. And we, we'd already sent up a couple of fighters just to be sure he was going to behave. This giant airplane comes flying past our ship, and in one of the windows of that airplane is a Russian guy holding up a centerfold from Playboy. <laughs> what? <laughs> that happened. Uh, So we get back to Yankee Station, and this is 1969, and the war is pretty full blown, but because of what's going on back home, uh, with, you know, they're burning colleges and uh, riots and all sorts of things. The Vietnam War is not popular. Um, so President uh, Nixon now decided that we're going to do things a little differently than we've been doing them, and we're going to restrict our bom bombing targets. One of the things that was happening was that they had begun negotiations with the North Vietnamese in uh, Paris, and I think that these negotiations went on for a couple of years. I'm sure mm -hmm. they must have, but anyway, the ramifications for us was that here we are operating at war, but we have real restrictions on our operations. Well, one of the gauges of a ship, uh, a, a, a ship at, at sea and at war is you're gauged on your performance. And we're an aircraft carrier, and our job is to launch and recover airplanes and blow things up and all that. But we weren't allowed to actually do much damage, so we would we would load up our airplanes, and these guys would take off on a sortie, and they would go just over the horizon, and they'd just drop their bombs. Or they would find some poor sampan and just strafe the heck out of it, or kill some water buffaloes or something like that, count it as a sortie and come back, do the whole thing over again. It was incredible. The effort, the money, all that that was that was just wasted because we were not allowed to hit 
real targets at that time. Soon afterwards, I think Nixon started bombing Haiphong uh, mm. Harbor, I, I guess. But there was a time that we were like, what are we doing? And even those of us who believed in what we were doing began to, to question uh, the purpose anymore. If we, you know, if you're not going to be allowed to do your job, do it well. So, anyway, after that, uh, about that time, uh, President Nixon decided he wanted to start winding the war down. And one of the things that they instituted was early outs, which meant that if you, if you still had uh, time to serve, uh, like you know, you had, you had enlisted for a four-year term or, or whatever it was, and you still had time, that they were going to start issuing early out. Uh, uh, notices so that you'd, you'd, you'd be discharged uh, and you could go home early. I was a very popular guy aboard ship when those messages started coming in. The teletype machines were clattering all day and all night with reams and reams and reams because these this was not just our ship, our task force. This was worldwide, all U.S. services. And every day that I'd go down for lunch or something, my name on that list, my name on that list. Um, and I had good news for some guys and not so good news for others. But one day my name was on that list and I still had a year and a half or so to go. And said, well, as soon as you get back to San Diego, you're, you're getting out. Works for me. Um, so uh, we get back to San Diego and uh, several of us were, were given or not discharge papers. I, I was I had enlisted as in Naval Reserve, so I still had three years of, of active reserve that I was obliged to, to serve. And uh, in Atlanta, I came back to Atlanta, uh, and I had to report to the uh, Naval uh, uh, offices at, located at Georgia Tech. And I walked in there, and uh, there was a Navy captain sitting behind the desk, and I walked in and said, Lieutenant Lett, reporting, sir. And he looked up and he said, son, you want to do this? And I'm standing at attention. I said, excuse me, sir, I don't understand. He said, son, I got junior officers coming out of my ears. If you don't want to do this, you just sign that piece of paper right there and, and you will have fulfilled all of your obligations to the Navy. Uh, full benefits, GI Bill, everything, but you don't have to report for the next three years for active duty. I said, I think I'll take that deal. You know, I'd been at sea for two and a half years or so. I was done with that. Mm. Uh, so that's that was my... Uh, uh, that was my exit. So what did you do after that? After you were, I went. To, I, I worked for Delta Airlines for a year uh, to save money to go back to graduate school. I was going to combine that with my ninety-dollar GI Bill to pay my way through grad school. To go from being a naval officer in charge of a lot of men and so forth to loading baggage on a Delta jet at four o'clock in the morning was was a grounding experience to say the least and probably good for me. I did that and I went to uh, went to grad school but my, my future wife was a stewardess on one of those flights and we met doing that. Um, oh I also I had been out for a year and I got a letter from the Navy Department telling me that I needed to report to the induction center on Ponce de Leon Avenue. And I ignored it. I'm like, I'm done, man. I got a piece of paper that says I'm done. Well, I got another letter about two months later. You have been instructed to report down for a physical for promotion. I don't think so. Well, the third letter was worded a little more to the point, like you are going to show up at Ponce de Leon, blah, blah, so I'm okay. I got my service jacket, and it's pretty thick and all that, and I go down there. Now, Ponce de Leon, I think the day it's called Ponce Market or something like that, and, and, and you know, all the millennials and everybody, it's a great place to be. In those days, 
thousands and thousands of guys went through there on their way to no man's land, really. So I went down there, I still don't know why, to, be, to get a physical, to be promoted after I'm already out. So I get down there and I've got this jacket with me and they tell me get in this line. And I said, okay. And there's little corporals and sergeants, you know, screaming at guys. And this is 1970, I guess, maybe, yeah, 70. And I'm standing in line with all these other people and we're going through the line and I've got my little bag full of tricks here. Nobody's asked me to see my papers. Okay, so I, I go in and they take my blood pressure and all that stuff, get in this line, okay. Finally, I, after like two hours of this induction process, I got to the end of the line and some sergeant says, he was a Marine sergeant. No, he wasn't, he was an Army guy. He says, all right, everybody in this line, you guys are going over here and you're going in the Army and you guys over here, you're going in the Marine Corps. And I'm standing there and, I, and he, he looked at me and he, he said, I didn't move. He said, what's your, what's your problem? I said, the only place I'm going is home. You're not going home, son. You're going to get on one of these buses and you're out of here today. And I said, Sergeant, somebody probably ought to take the time to read this. <laughs> well, he looked at the first page and, oh boy, he's got another <laughs> sergeant to come over and look at that. Sorry, sir. I said, yeah, I think you ought to be. I said, all I came down here for was, I was told to be down here for a physical to be promoted. And you, you guys have put me through this wonderful day of, of rigmarole and, and uh, I couldn't believe it. It was just funny. I don't know if anything like that ever happened to anybody else, but. It's the first time I've heard it. <laughs> Lucky me. <laughs> But I went home. <laughs> so, so after, after that episode, I mean, what, what about the rest of the time? I mean, did you work for, uh, who did you work for after Delta? Well, I went to grad school and I was working on my doctorate in uh, anthropology and archaeology. And um, being a, in graduate school uh, in 1970 as a Vietnam veteran was not a welcoming place to be. First of all, I was several years older than the other grad students. And so they pretty much ostracized me from the get-go because I was a baby killer. Hmm. So they say. Uh, that I, you know, that I could deal with, but what bothered me more than that was the professors who made life not fun. And I had met my future wife. I said, you know, I'm just going to take a break, uh, see what happens. I went to work, uh, worked in sales and marketing for the next, I never did go back to grad school, by the way. But anyway, worked for the next few years in marketing and sales. Um, in 19, and I'm sorry, 2000 and Eight. This was when the bottom fell out, with, you know, the economy, and uh, I got I got that phone call about, well, you know, economy's gone bad. We appreciate all your effort for the last thirty something years, but this is it. And uh, I said, okay, I, I think I was sixty-two or something like that, and you know, the future isn't looking great. But they so the company said, well. We're going to set you up with one of these really highfalutin uh, placement firms here in Atlanta. And I guess they're great. I went down there to figure out how to jumpstart things. And so we're sitting in there, and there, I think there are about 30 other people in this class. And it came to writing resume time. And they said, well, if how many of you have written your resume yet? Well, okay. Uh, he said, how many of you have military service? I raised my hand. I think I was the only person in that room who 
had military service. He said, Mr. Lett, would you tell us about, uh, first of all, have you done your resume yet? Yeah. Did you put your military service on your resume? Hell no. He, and he turned to the class, he said, now listen to what this man's telling you. He said, why, didn't, why is your military service not on your resume? Because you don't put on your resume you're a Vietnam veteran. Um, and people just looked at each other and looked, <laughs> looked at me. He said, you're not kidding. I said, I'm not kidding. When I first got out and went, went to work, uh-uh, you didn't want that on your resume. He said, well, tell us about your service. I said, well, I was an officer in the United States Navy. What did you do? Communications officer on an aircraft carrier. Did you have clearance? Top secret crypto security. And you couldn't put that on your resume. He said, think about it, folks, that this man had this experience and all that, and, and he didn't want to put it on there because it w might work against him. One guy turned around, he said, top secret crypto security. Can you tell us whether or not there really are aliens? <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, you know, that, that was just the way it was in those days. Two years ago, I, I joined an outfit here in Atlanta called the Atlanta Vietnam Veterans Business Association. And I have to say that I'm really happy and proud to be a member of this group. But for years, for 30, almost, yeah, 30 years, people had asked me to, you know, are you involved in any of the groups? I said, let me tell you something. I'm not interested in going down to some and I don't mean any disrespect to any, any other groups. I really don't. But I said, I'm not interested in sitting down with a bunch of old guys with scraggly beards who still wear camo, and they, and they just want to bitch and moan about stuff that happened 50 years ago. I'm not there. Please come to the AVVBA. It's not like that at all. I said, I'll, I'll come. Well, it, it was such a uh, professional organization uh, with the right attitude and... Uh, it's, it's been, I've been very happy to be associated with them, and the few people I've had a chance to meet have been wonderful. I met one fellow, I, I, unfortunately I don't remember his name. Maybe, maybe you can help me, but he's a, he lives in Noonan. He's a retired Navy captain. This fellow worked his way up from an E-1 to an O-6 as a Navy corpsman. And for anybody who knows anything about Navy corpsmen, they're all called Doc. Mm -hmm. And this guy was on the ground with the Marines uh, in Vietnam and, and elsewhere. And to go from E-1 to O-6 is, is a real feat, I think. Very nice I guy. Yeah. I only met him once. I wish I could have called his name. Before we run out of time here, can you just show us the uh, what you brought with you? The uh... Well, okay. That's me. Uh, okay. Fifty years ago, <laughs> I brought this. In the Navy, we don't get much bling, you know. Um, but I am proud of this. I, after, after I, I don't know if you're it's, picking that up or not. But you may have to pull it back, Tony, because the light's light. Light. Okay. okay. Well, okay. Another serendipitous thing that I received. Uh, a year and a half after I'd been out of the Navy. I got a nice little letter and all that and a, and a medal and a thing and it's the uh, Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medal. And it's, it was awarded to me by Vice Admiral Bringle who was the commander of the 7th Fleet when I was out there. And it's uh, for meritorious achievement while attached to and serving in Bon Ham Richard as radio officer. Uh, and it says that I, I guess, did a pretty good job. Uh, it says for meritorious, I would have understood it better if it said notorious <laughs> service. <laughs> but I'm proud of that. Um, like I say, the Navy, we don't, we don't have that much bling that we get to, <laughs> to paste. So I'm proud of that and uh, proud of my service. I, I, uh, I. I, prob I know I'd do it again, but 
I, I uh, the way things are today, I, uh, if I had a son who could serve, I have to say I would have to sit down and discuss it long and hard with him. Well, uh, let me just ask you one more thing uh, as we close out. Uh, what we would like to do is ask the veterans to just editorialize or make any comment on any topic, your service, the current state of the world or whatever, or just whatever you want to say, just as kind of a closing statement. Okay, thank you. Uh, I grew up in the 50s in a wonderful country at a wonderful time. I am the offspring of the greatest generation. My father was a war hero. My mother was involved as the wife of the CEO of a squadron in dealing with the other wives. Um, we went through a war that, that was unpopular. Uh, and it was a war, the first war, that we did not win. Uh, and, and that's the historic fact. I have never been uh, terribly, um, oh, what's the word? I, I don't believe that we should wallow in what was our plight at the time. It, is, it was what it was. The guys who I think really deserve the recognition that they never have gotten are, are the Korean War veterans because the greatest generation was World War II, the Vietnam generation was what we were, and the other guys were just overlooked, and I, I find that to be a travesty. I will say that in today's world, in this country, anybody who serves does so by their choice. There is no draft. And these young people today that go in the military have my highest respect because they go bad places and do things that they don't have to do. I think it's, le it's certainly less than 1% of the population in this country has any skin in the game at all anymore. And I think that's sad for the country People don't have a sense of who we are anymore and, and our role ha as it has been in the world and, and I wish would continue to be. Uh, everything that we've ever done, in my opinion, has been honorable. Mistakes have been made, no doubt about it, but the purpose and the goal was liberation and freedom for other people, not domination and not to kill people. It's a dirty job. but. This country and its service has reached the epitome in world history of accomplishments. And we did save the world once. And I think we are doing what we can today in spite of the political um, reigns which started in Vietnam to get the job done. Freedom. Freedom ain't free. And I worry that enough people are willing to sacrifice in the future to continue our freedom, if they even really understand what that means anymore, because they're not taught it. So I have high hopes and unfortunately not high expectations. I worry about this country. I hope we wake up soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for participating in the program and thank you for your service. Thank you, sir.